Greetings AP Calculus BC students, Mr. Record here for our final video that covers topic 8.13, which really would be our final video that covers all of topic 8 as well from the AP Calculus CED. Now we're actually talking about a, a subject that's not tested on the advanced placement AB or BC exam for that matter, and that's surface area of a solid of revolution. But because it's very likely a part of most every college's Calculus II curriculum. I'd like to spend a little bit of time with my BC students to talk about it, and uh, maybe it can help you guys out there as well if you're watching from somewhere else other than Avon High School. What we're going to do here is take a look at example six from my notes, one mole area. Now, if you remember from before, we outlined the development of the formula for the area of a surface of revolution, and it's all built upon using 2 pi r times l, what was the frustum of a cone's lateral area. And we, we talked about this r of x, or in this case, r of y, if your function is set up in terms of y, as being the radius. And that's what's very important, especially in this particular example that you're about to see. Because what is kind of sometimes a misconception is that you can revolve around a vertical axis to find this surface area of revolution and still use x as your independent variable. You can integrate with respect to x, although it's a vertical axis of revolution. And I think example six is going to illustrate that very nicely. So scrolling down to our wonderful example six. So what we've got here is a question that's asking us to find the area of the surface formed by revolving the graph of f of x equal x squared on the interval 0 to square root of 2 about the y-axis as shown to the right. And, and we see that nice function, x squared. The revolution is certainly happening in about the y-axis, and we're taking this outside area into consideration. That's what we're trying to find. We also have kind of a strange boundary here, this square root of 2, which is a little bit bigger than 1 there. So, as always, I start by finding the derivative of the function that they gave me, and this one is probably the easiest one yet. The derivative of x squared is 2x. <coughs> Excuse me. So next, we're going to go ahead and we are going to square our f prime. And if we square our f prime, that's going to give us 4x squared. So all the preliminary work is done, we can now go about setting up our surface area. So we need to start with 2 pi. We know we're going to integrate something. And we know that we're going to have a radius. Let's go ahead and talk about the radius, because that's really the, the nuts and bolts of this example. If we look at this picture and we start to think, of self, uh, think to ourselves, OK, what would the radius be? What is the length from the axis of revolution to the curve? We find that that's now a horizontal distance. And any horizontal distance that's measured from the y-axis can just arbitrarily be x every single time. So that's our radius. If the vertical axis of symmetry is the y-axis, you can always let the radius be x, and it's no exception. That's what you're going to use every time. You just got to remember that, because if you set it up otherwise with that f of x, it's going to lead to an incorrect result. Everything else is pretty standard. 1 plus the f prime squared. I forgot to put my square here earlier, so let's fix that. So I have 1 plus 4x squared with respect to x. And the only thing really left to do now is make sure we co collect the right boundaries into the problem. Since we are integrating with respect to x, our boundaries must be x's. And so that 0 to square root of 2 is going to work. And I know you might be wondering, square root of 2, hmm, that's a funny boundary. There's a little bit of method to my madness why I'm using that. So you'll see in a moment. Let's go ahead and do our u substitution like before, because this is a pretty straightforward u sub problem. Um, for those of you who've learned some advanced integration technique, and maybe you're thinking, hmm, maybe this could be an inverse, or I'm sorry, a, a trigonometric substitution with maybe tangent. 
No, not with an X there. This X here is going to make this one so much easier that you can just integrate it with U sub. So you're going to get 8X with respect to X, which means you're going to have to put a 1 8 in front to offset that result. So now we're going to integrate the square root of U with respect to U. Now, about those boundaries, well, if square root of 2 was the original boundary, I'd like to see if we can write that in terms of u. That way we don't have to back substitute. Well, it turns out that if we insert square root of 2 for our x, we actually get 1 plus 4 times 2, which is 9. And so that's a pretty clean boundary. I'm going to go with it. And if we do the same thing for 0, this one's perhaps a little easier because 1 plus 4 times 0 squared is just going to be 1. And now we have a nice pretty lower boundary. Let's simplify our 2 pi times 1 eighth. Go ahead and integrate square root of u, which seems like we so often do in this particular topic. We get u to the 2 thirds, uh, u to the 3 halves, sorry, times 2 thirds. Right? Dividing by 3 halves is the same as multiplying by 2 thirds. And then we have our boundaries. If I do a bit of simplifying here, pi over 4 times 2 thirds, I believe that would give me pi over 6, if I'm not mistaken. And then if I insert the 9 in for the x, or for the u, I should say, I get 9 to the 3 halves. And then if I subtract and insert 1 for the u, I get 1 to the 3 halves. And something kind of interesting happens. For the first time, in several videos at least, we have a nice perfect square that we are raising to the 3 halves power, which means you can square root the 9 cleanly to get a 3, cube it to get a 27, and we have a pretty number finally. And then, of course, 1 to the 3 halves is 1. And so you can eventually call this 26 sixths pi or 13 thirds times pi or 13 um, pi over 3 if you want to put the pi in the numerator. Either way is fine. So you see, in order to get these clean answers from this type of integration technique, we almost invariably have to have a square root as a, as a boundary to make that happen. So that completes not only this video, but all of the videos that pertain to topic uh, unit eight, I'm sorry, and, and particularly topic 13, the final topic from unit eight. Anyway, I hope these have been very helpful to you and I will look forward to seeing you at my next videos.